Hi, everybody. This is Scott Park Phillips, and we have a real treat for you today. Catherine Alexander, uh, who is a professor of Chinese language and literature at the CU, Col University of Colorado in Boulder. And uh, she is probably the best hire they've ever made. She's really fantastic. Uh, she, she finished her PhD at the University of Chicago. She has actually a degree in physics. Uh, she grew, no, something yeah. like that. Anyway, it's a science degree. She'll fill you in. And uh, if she wants to. She grew up in Taiwan. And it, my, are you obviously um, fluent in Mandarin? Are you fluent in one of the Min languages, one of the Taiwanese languages? Which in English is? I said, um, I can, of course, speak Mandarin, but I can also speak Taiwanese, although my Taiwanese is better at listening than spoken, because most of my Taiwanese was learned at church. And when you're at church, you're listening to someone else talk, and you're not talking a whole lot yourself. <laughs> so that's an important detail there, is that you have a, a missionary family. Yeah. Uh, I came from a missionary family. And you, you have so a, a deep religious awareness of of Chinese culture and uh, and one of the reasons another of the reasons it's fascinating to talk to you and so what I'm hoping to bring to everybody today is a discussion of Journey to the West Shioji uh, which is some people might know as the story of the monkey and uh, it's a really fantastic story and for people in the martial arts world it plays a key role uh, in the development of Chinese martial arts. And uh, so I'm, since she lectures, I'm going to try and let her do a little lecturing, and then I'm going to be, you know, the bad student and ask questions, and, and then we'll have a conversation, too. That's so, a good student, right? Oh, well, I'm, that's just not my thing. But yes, I will, I'll be an inspiring student. How about that? All right, excellent. Uh, go for it. So when Scott and I were meeting about a month and a half ago, I think we had coffee one morning and talked a bit about um, what are some of the things that I've been working on and teaching this semester and what kind of conversations could we have? And I said, well, you know, I'm teaching Journey to the West in passing um, in both of the classes I'm teaching this semester, both for the undergraduates as an introduction to Chinese civilization, because the Monkey King is always absolutely the best ambassador for Chinese culture and often is used as an ambassador for Chinese culture. And then also for my master's students, because this um, Journey to the West, this novel from the 16th century gives us a lot of different ways at looking at how scholars approach a large work which never wants to really resolve into a single coherent interpretation. So then what do you do with a text like this? How do you approach it? What are many different ways you could kind of parse it that allow for um, us to explain why it was so popular, continues to be so popular, and is useful for us in understanding Chinese popular culture, Chinese popular religion, and pretty much a grab bag of anything else that you would want. But um, I don't want to assume too much familiarity uh, with the novel, so I just want to go through a few kind of main points. And then, um, Scott, please interrupt me at any point in this and um, ask for clarification. Okay. And um, my cats may pop up every once in a while, so um, this is who we've got right now. <laughs> Good. Yeah. All right. We have a mouse here, but hopefully we won't see it. Oh. All right. I'm going to move you down there. All right. So the Journey to the West, the novel that we talk about, C.O.Z., 
Um, our oldest extant version is from 1592, and it's this 100 chapter version. Now, this novel doesn't come out of nothing. It's not like one creative person sat down and imagined the whole thing, and it's their singular authorial creation. I'll get back to that in a second. Um, the story itself of a monk who went to India to get scriptures and had some supernatural assistance to help him along the way goes back much, much further in Chinese popular oral traditions and popular written traditions. Um, we have scattered references to the monkey and the monk in poetry from the Tang and Song periods onwards, um, Song especially. There are actually is a series of plays that were written in China in, um, I want to say the 14th century. I'm blanking a moat for right now. But these plays um, were rediscovered in Japan, and they are 24 sections long of the various adventures of the monkey and the monk. Another early source that shows us that these were stories that were um, had a wide range of currency, and even interestingly enough, traveled in a way, um, is a long section of um, a Korean textbook for merchants going to China called the Pak Tong Sang Anhe. And it has sections teaching these Korean merchants Chinese using elements of the story of the monkey and the monk. Um, also, obviously, we don't have a lot of oral stories that were written down, but from the little bits and pieces that we have that remain to us written before that 1592 story, we know that this was pervasive throughout kind of the popular mindset and culture of storytelling in um, China from the Song onwards. Um, so the Song starting in the 960s, right? Um, but what we have to go back to is thinking about where does the story come from? And with that, um, actually, I'm going to skip ahead first, and then I'll come back to where the story Yeah, yeah. Who is this guy? Ahead. Who is yeah, Shenzhen? Yeah, right? Who is Shenzhen? So again, like I said, the story doesn't come out of nowhere. It um, helps. Uh, it comes out of actual historical fact. Um, but highly, highly embellished over the centuries as we go from a historical monk who really made a journey to India to get scriptures um, being turned in the popular imagination into a completely fictional monk who goes to India to get scriptures on a much more kind of spiritual adventure type journey than the actual journey of the monk Shenzong. But first, taking us back to the historical moment, because even this story that is such high fantasy is itself rooted in some kind of historical fact. We have the monk Xuanzang, and he, is, um, he was born to an elite family. He became a Buddhist monk quite young. And what he realized in his own practices as a monk was that he really wanted to go back to the source of Buddhism. And what, but the problem at this time is that to leave China, you actually needed a permit from the emperor, basically. And the monk was not able to get one of these permits. And so he actually illegally left China, snuck out with um, traders on the Silk Road, um, went through what we have to assume are considerable difficulties to get to India, toured all over India, did kind of his Buddhist tour of all the best sites, and actually did bring back a serious amount of scriptures. By the time he got back to China, he'd been gone for so long um, that when he went to the emperor, he was pardoned for the crime of having left illegally. Um, and especially because the emperor was really interested in not so much the scriptures that he brought, but what kind of um, what kind of intelligence did he pick up along the way about those other kingdoms? What kind of intelligence did he pick up about you know trade routes and diplomatic things and things that would be useful for a man in political power? He was actually offered position in court, but the monk being himself an actual incredibly devout and um, really learned um, member of the Buddhist clergy 
said that he wanted to instead work to translate all of these texts into Chinese for the sake of Chinese believers. And we do still have um, Xunzang translations of some of these Buddhist texts that came from India. Uh, and so this is the real historical person that we're talking about, um, an incredibly accomplished monk, uh, multilingual, deeply dedicated to his Buddhist faith. Fact. Now, we, once we get into fiction, we get a completely different kind of character. So I'm going to go back to the slide where I talk about methods of interpreting the story. And then I want to go forward and just talk a little bit about some of the main characters in the story, starting from our fictional monk. What we want to keep in mind is that our historical monk is in many ways quite heroic and inspiring. And our fictional monk is going to be basically the opposite. He's okay. kind of he's kind of doesn't really have it together that much, does he? Oh no, not at all. He's hilarious. Um, I have a few quotes to share from that too. You know, um, uh, Xuan Zhang. So Xuan, uh, obviously, people who are it, been listening to my talks uh, that have anything to do with Taoism are familiar with that character um, as dark or mysterious mm -hmm. um and the other character um gets used as a pun for organs is that right i'm not sure dong so the the 12th dong mm -hmm. um so i just you know i i because because part of part of uh having the conversation about martial arts and literature is to look at the most transgressive elements mm -hmm. and in this case um, mysterious organ as a name is profound in its own uh <laughs> well, its and own you absurd can see way how it offers up also room for the story to go off in all kinds of different directions where all it mm -hmm. takes is somebody who's you know telling a story about hey did you know about this monk and like wow hey let's think about his name what if he were actually a secret Taoist? And you start to see how we're really looking at the beginnings of fiction being inspired or, you know, drawn out reinterpretations. I also want to point out, though, this, this little culmination, <laughs> because one of the points that we're not going to talk about it today, but I always want to point this out whenever I talk about Journey to the West, is that Although we have that 100 chapter edition from 1592, it's not like the tradition freezes there at all. Um, in fact, the tradition goes on. I'm going to try to grab a book from my uh, makeshift bookshelf here. The tradition goes on long after that. Um, we have subsequent uh, adaptations of the story. We have the monkey kind of going off into other adventures. And this book is utterly delightful, um, Transforming Monkey. It's all about the monkey's life after the Journey to the West novel, um, including uh, how he appears in contemporary film, um, contemporary American literature written by Chinese Americans, um, and even um, sort of 20th century um, communist uses of this monkey. And so when I say culminating in this novel, that we would say that that's kind of the big point, the hundred chapters, right? But it doesn't mean that like it ends there. The story is still within the popular realm and still developing even as we speak, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I would just quickly point out that there are temples. Yes. Uh, to Sun yeah, oh, I've... And and I should have put in the slide of a temple I went to with an altar to him that I have a photo of. Yeah. Yeah, altars and, and very common trans uh, God to uh, possessing God for trans yes. mediums, both, of course, in the Boxer Uprising, but contemporarily. Absolutely. Um, um, and so, you know, there's still contemporary relevance and belief in Sun Wukong mm. um, as a deity. Yeah. And and the the oldest film I don't know if you know this we we did a talk on it I did a, an interview on uh, where we talked about film 
Uh, it's the the Spider Woman. Ah, uh, what's it called? Oh, the, the Spider Woman. The uh-huh. oldest surviving Chinese film is actually uh, Monkey Story. That's marvelous. That's so perfect, right? It's almost like the monkey's been planning it all along. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Keep going. Sorry for the trip. <laughs> no, this is, I, I love sort of thinking about, you know, if, if literature is really just using us for its own self-perpetuation sometimes. <laughs> um, all right, let's go back. So um, the Ameri- Chinese American scholar, Anthony Yu, um, who died in 2015, if I'm, I think so. Here's yes. his book. I got mine too. Okay. <laughs> um, so he is um, really defined the study of the journey to the West in the U.S. for decades, um, especially because of his full-length translation of the hundred-chapter novel, and then eventually he translated a shortened version, which is utterly delightful to read. Um, And in general, he says that he takes kind of three approaches to the novel, that you can read it as a tale of travel and adventure, right? That it's just, it can be a fun story. And that's how um, I think a lot of pop culture has taken it for like the movies and, you know, this Spider Woman original movie, um, even on um, stage in Peking Opera and things like that. But um, there are multiple levels to read it. The next way that a lot of people tend to take it is as it's a story of Buddhist karma and redemption. So like one of these Inyan Inyan tales, um, where all of the various people who are populating the story are working through their karmic debts and have to work through them over the course of the journey so that by the end of the journey, they can achieve Buddhahood because they have um, been able to uh, create enough merit to make up for those debts. And then we kind of see the um, laws of karma play out in the story. Um, And then another level, which is um, pervasive from the Qing dynasty, actually, is that the story can be read as an allegory of Taoist alchemical self-cultivation. And you're going to have to kind of talk a little bit more about that because all I know about it is what I've read from Anthony Yu's explanations. Um, But in general, he's said that, um, so there's an early Qing abridged edition of the 100 chapter novel. And it tends to be that um, the full length novels don't get as much readership as as an abridged edition anyway, right? Which is why we have this one. Um, but this early one from the Qing um, called Xiu Zhen Quan, um, which kind of puns, I guess, off Quan Taoism also, mm, right? Right. But Xiu Zhen Quan um, by Chen Shibin is an abridged version that consists of a lot of commentary as well, where he takes the story as like a full, and he, he basically looks at the story and he looks for yin yang cosmology, he looks for alchemy, and he looks for references to the I Ching. And he parses the story on those terms and basically says that the entire story is a treatise on internal alchemy. And this uh, interpretation was actually quite dominant throughout the Qing. So, as much as we're talking about the story as being based upon a Buddhist monk, we have to think about as it's circulating in the Qing, it really has this uh, Taoist sense to it as well. So we'll come back to all of these things, and I'm sure we'll have some interesting conversation about those. Yeah, yeah, well. yeah. I would, I would probably, um, add, I'd probably even just add a fourth, but built on that. But we'll. we'll oh, well, what would your we'll fourth be? Because this is well, just Anthony Ears levels, right? These are exactly. only three ways that he says, like, let's look at it these ways. And yeah. that's a start. So the fourth way would be Uh to say that this is theater Uh and that what you're doing um, without effort when you read it is immersing yourself in a world through tsun, through visualization, Uh which which in the Taoist sense could also be actualization. Yes. And so Um, you're you're engaged um, in in the personal version of a much larger ritual, which you Mm -hmm. would see on the stage. And as an audience member, if you were to watch it on the stage, you would in fact be, without effort, visualizing 
because you know they're just have an occasional prop, right? Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. entire scene is visualized by the audience, and in a replication of Taoist ritual, um, although a, a very funny one, a very narrative one, mm -hmm. and that the practice of being an actor, so the the, the base practice, uh, everybody learned the animal roles before learning human roles. Um, so you you learned um, Dao Yin, or Dao Yin. Uh, which you know is also Taoist alchemy. You you learn all the five elements as kind of character training, mm -hmm. but also as alchemy, uh, so that you are performing ritual Taoist alchemy on the stage, mm -hmm. and the audience is contributing to the visual visualization without again without in Wu Wei right mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. effort, um, and. That's just me cracking this open because it doesn't stop. Is it? What kind of exorcism is it? Mm -hmm. Well, and then that would fit in. Like I know very little about the um, Zajri plays, the ones that are mm. pr uh, predecessors to the novel. Well, no, we don't know if it's a direct link. It probably isn't a direct link, but but a hundred, our, our, hundred, hundred and fifty years earlier at least. Yeah, exactly, and that's perfect, right? That these are like staged kind of collective ritual um, because what is the stage if not kind of participating in a mass performance? Um, all right. We'll have to talk about that more if we can find, you know, oh, I don't know if I have much more to offer on that one. There's more links. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right. Fox. So let's think about the fictional monk. Um, what does Tang Xuanzang become or what does Xuanzang become when he becomes Tang San Zhang, the character. He becomes a quite a different sort of monster. Um, let's close that for a second. All right. So we get a completely different backstory. Instead of our hero monk who is dedicated to Buddhism, you know, as a teenager, and then uh, heroically sort of sneaks out of China to get his texts, we have a fascinatingly different story, um, which very clearly has its origins in sort of the popular metier. Tang San Zhang is born to a woman who has been kidnapped. And once she gives birth to him, he is abandoned. He's found by a monk. And then later he's able to rescue his mother. And what I think is really interesting about this is that it makes him out to be a pure Buddhist from basically the moment that he was picked up by the monk. So he has never been part of kind of the dusty human secular world. And then also because he's able to rescue his mother and do all of the things that are like a filial Chinese son is expected to do. Um, we have him being perfect in many different, he ticks all the boxes, right? Fictionally speaking. And then this journey, instead of being one that he conceives of on his own as wanting to go and sneaks away from China, we have it flipped. So what happens instead is that Guan Yin says, I would like somebody from China to get these scriptures. And so she creates the conditions necessary to make it so that someone from China has to go to India to get the scriptures. And she does it in such a way that the emperor himself seeks out Tang San Zheng to be the scripture pilgrim. And so instead of leaving without anybody approving, instead we have the highest levels of approval, both in the secular world of politics with the emperor, but also Guan Yin, who matters even more, right? <laughs> We also, he is just such, how do you describe him? But he's just kind of a pill, right? He's, he's sanctimonious, cowardly. He's really pious, but in ways that show that his piety is incredibly shallow. Um, he really needs his supernatural assistance because he's non-functional otherwise. And um, he is also constantly being tricked by kind of exterior appearances so much so that he kind of can't see through 
the sort of surface lies that even the readers can see through as they're going through the novel. And so we've gone from our hero becoming almost like our comedic foil. And really, there are ways you can look at him as a stand-in for sort of the, the useless mortal who has to try to blunder their way through life in the hopes that they can one day achieve some kind of um, transcendence. I just want to point out, and this is from the Whaley translation because I assigned this to um, my undergraduates. The Whaley translation is an older translation, so not the Yu translation. Um, it's a little bit easier to read, but it is much less scholarly and it's um, modified a lot more just for the sake of reading ability. But I just want to point out so, in the first chapter where the monk goes off on his journey, how quickly this facade of him being somebody who is a religious expert who can handle the trials of the pilgrimage falls in the space of two pages. So we begin with this. So Tang San Zhang Tripitaka is um, about to leave China and he's at a monastery and he's talking to all the different monks about this journey he's about to go on. And they're all really worried about how difficult the journey will be. And they keep praising him for how, you know, brave he is. And so they asked him about, you know, how wide the rivers are, how high the mountains are, the roads being filled with panthers and tigers and demons. He says nothing. And he keeps just pointing at his own heart. The priest did not understand what he meant. And when at last they asked him to explain, he said, it is the heart alone that can destroy them. So he begins the journey basically by saying that he is already able to surmount all difficulties because he has kind of perfected his heart. Um, because he's made this vow, because he kind of has this um, particular devotion to the Heart Sutra especially, then they all say, ah, what a loyal and valiant cleric, they cry in chorus. This all goes to hell very soon. Um, on the very next page, he is captured by ogres. His assistants, his human assistants are eaten. And um, he now doesn't know what to do because he's been completely destroyed in the space of a few hours. He's in the depths of despair and he lost all hope of escaping with his life. Um, this happened in the space of two pages. So we've already seen just how weak he is. An old man appears carrying a heavy staff and of course he is a Taoist immortal too. And the Taoist immortal helps Tripitaka get out of this situation and begins to show us that this journey is not going to be the kind of journey where a human can manage it at all. He is going to need the help of all of the various deities and immortals and spiritual forces out there to help him get along the way because his human imperfections are no match for everything that's going to be thrown at him. What's funny is once he meets the monkey, it happens again, right? The monkey goes off, they have a fight, the monkey runs off. And when the monkey comes back to find Tripitaka, Tripitaka says, well, I don't have the heart to go on. And this imagery of the heart is used constantly throughout the novel about, can you control your heart? Do you have the heart? Do you, you know, is the heart going to hold you back or is it something that will help you along the way? What does it really mean to have heart? All right. Um, yeah. Can I stop you for a second there? Because, Please do. Because uh, and I'm glad you chose the Wh Whaley translation. That's the Whaley translation, right? Yes, this is. This yeah. is just, yeah. Yeah, I have, I have that one too. Um, the, um, uh, so the term shin here is means both heart and mind. Mm -hmm. And 
And uh, it, see, it seemed to me we get a lot of, you know, you have to make a choice as a translator <laughs> because it's very awkward to say heart mind unless you're <laughs> writing a, some kind of Buddhist treaty. Yeah. Or something. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, so, so in the, within the two translations, we, there would be a lot of difference of whether it's the heart or it's the mind. And uh, one of the, that comment there about, you know, having refined your heart will allow you to face tigers and rhinos and stuff um, is, is actually like a Tao Te Ching. There's a Tao Te Ching chapter, mm-hmm. uh, not the number, but it's the one, it's like a three and 10 choose life, three and 10 choose death, three and 10 though they choose life. It doesn't work. Um, <laughs> you've no doubt heard of those who are good at cultivating Tao. They mm-hmm. walk through mountains uh, without, you know, without getting clawed and that that the Buddhists showed up basically in China and and said, well, you know, we don't need that because our heart is refined or our mind is refined. It's like a mm-hmm. mirror. Uh, and we can just, you know, we don't need we don't need your talismans to get into the wilderness. We yeah. we, we are a talisman. So, right. And how quickly that falls apart, doesn't it? Well, right. So then you, so, so that the reason I brought it up is because you, the book appears to be on the surface, you know, pro Buddhist, and then other times pro Taoist, and mm-hmm. other times Confucian. And I think from maybe from chapter to chapter, it might actually be different. Like the, mm-hmm. that one point being that the chapters mm-hmm. may be written by different people with different opinions, but that. In a sense, it's this wonderful critique of like everybody's view. Yeah. Oh, it absolutely is. Um, I really enjoy kind of the the way that the novel skewers absolutely everybody. Particularly, I think, because what it's skewering is... um, People who are, I don't know, not insincere, but perhaps believe too much in their own perfection without necessary the the need to actually engage in constant cultivation. So, so South Park. (laughs) (laughs) Perhaps, yes, we could make a parallel with monkey and all kinds of things. (laughs) Um, See, where am I going next? Aha. So, um, in chapter 13 of the full 100 chapter novel, that's where the monkey and the monk connect up with each other. And this is the first of his disciples. um, And he is in many ways the most powerful of the disciples. And this is why the monkey kind of ends up stealing the show, except that I don't think it was the story about the monk at all in the first place. Um, The novel, the 100 chapter novel begins with the story of the monkey. It begins by talking about his cultivation, um, his kind of awareness that just being a monkey is not enough, becoming a Taoist immortal, ascending to what we consider to be kind of a Taoist heaven, causing all kinds of a mess there, and eventually the Taoist deities say, well, we, we got to call in the Buddha to get this monkey under control, to get this heart mind under control, right? Um, because he but, represents the mind. Yes, he absolutely does. They call him the mind monkey throughout the novel. Um, and it's very clear that he's one aspect. You could you could maybe see all of the pilgrims as like one, like one whole person, perhaps. That's one way of going through the novel is thinking about all of these pilgrims as component parts of the human self or the human psyche, perhaps. Um, and so the monkey is very clearly like the, the mind and heart and emotions. The next character we get is the pig, Zhu Jie. And he can be seen as a representation of like appetites and desires. Um, So he is not only um, sort of constantly hungry like a pig would be, 
but he also has a lot more sort of sexual desire than anybody else does in the story. We kind of first meet him as somebody who's like stolen someone's wife. Um, and then another, the third of the so, disciples. Yeah, so, go ahead. So sex, drugs, rock and roll, and he's a foodie too. Yeah, yeah. Although he's not a foodie because he's indiscriminate about his food choices. He just wants to eat. So his appetite's out of control. Yes. So we have a, kind of a mind out of control. We have appetites out of control. The thing about the journey to the West is that there's no one perfect allegory. And that would make, it, it'd be so easy if this was just like, um, what, the Christian Pilgrim's Progress or something. Right, right. Where every one of the characters is just like strictly one thing or the other. Um, it would be also a lot more boring. Because mm. the next character we get, the Sha He Sang, the Sandy Monk, he's really almost a non-entity in many ways. Um, he doesn't have you know, a particular way that we can typify him as like, if the monkey is the mind out of control and the pig is the appetite or desire out of control, then what is the Sandy Monk out of control? It doesn't map that well. Um, but he ends up being the third disciple. And then um, we have one more figure along the way. Uh, well, here's Guan Yin, um, who's leading the, the, whole, um, the whole journey uh, in the background, right? Mm, mm, mm. And um, our last figure here is the horse. Um, because the horse is actually a, um, a, a dragon prince who also has something that he needs to kind of um, account for or you know, pay his debt for karmically. So he's transformed into a supernatural horse who can actually handle the journey because the journey is too difficult for an, a mortal horse. Um, so we have our, you know, our various figures here. Right, so the the his it sort of represents um, strong and sensitive or something. Um, the yeah, you know, and he is. It's it's you almost forget for most of the book that the horse is actually like a sentient entity, um, because so often he's just well, and then they got they brought the horse along too. But he too is an immortal being. Uh, right. But isn't there a part of your body? Like, right. So it's, it's particularly interesting that, mm -hmm. th that you could take a very psychological view of this as well. Yes. Yes, you could. Um, so he's the, he's the part of your body that you're sort of dragging along or something, <laughs> or then suddenly runs off on its yeah. own. Well, and then they play often throughout the novel with this uh, Chinese idiom, xinyuan ima, the heart mind is a monkey and the intentions are a horse. Hmm. Um, terrible translation off the top mm -hmm. of my head. But we don't often see the sort of e, the intentionality as the horse, aside, you know, as the horse actually acting that out. But we throughout the entire book see the, the heart is a monkey fully realized in the mm. entire mm. book um there's another there is there's a pretty important chinese idiom too that um school teachers like to badger their students with i think that's um you know tame the wild horse mm -hmm. you know otherwise how you know basically it's do your homework but you know <laughs> pay attention in class right but this this idea that everybody has a wild horse and if you're going to learn, you need to tame it. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, this horse is tamed through the whole story. So it doesn't end up being, we don't get the lesson that, mm. you know, a different author might want to put into the story um, with the horse. Cool. Okay. Yeah. All right. What do I have next? Oh, yes. I just love these woodblock prints. There's just something that's so sweet about them. Um, so. But when we look at the novel itself, I just want to point out um, another kind of set of structure to it. So we meet the monkey at the beginning. And I think that this really tells us that 
you know, COD is about the monkey, right? Um, this version of the story, it's, it's entirely about the monkey. Yes, we have Tang Xuanzang and, you know, going off on this whole journey, but that's kind of secondary to the fact that, you know, people really have latched onto the monkey as that character that kind of grasps their imaginations and is good to work with in many ways. Um, then we get the setup. And then from chapters 13 to 99, it's the journey. And what we learn by the time we get to chapter 99 itself, and just think about the numbers here, right? This is very consciously crafted. In mm. chapter 99, the Buddha and his disciples are looking over all of the trials that they've gone, that the pilgrims have gone through and realize that they've only gone through 80 and that they needed to go through 81 to complete the required number. And so what we end up with is in chapter 99, we have a completion of the 81 trials. So nine times nine is 81. And that ends up also being three times three, three for perfection times three times three times three. So it all kind of works together to a cohesive whole. Um, and then they like get back to China and it just kind of happens at the end and like the story's over, right? The point that, of the story is not getting them back to China. Eight, so so uh, nine, 81 is the number of chapters in the Tao Te Ching. Um, 81 is also the number of years of gestation that Lao Tzu lived in Xiguan Mu's belly or depending um, on the version you hear. Um, uh, yeah, it's used a lot in 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 uh, in exorcisms too. So there's 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 something about a yeah completion there. Yeah. And so, and you know when you think about this number, you start to realize again that although the surface level of the story is of a Buddhist pilgrim going on a pilgrimage, um, Anthony Yu says in some of his scholarship on the novel that um, basically there is a pervasive use of Taoist vocabulary throughout the entire novel. And um, that we see it in the poetry, we see it in the opening couplets to every chapter, and that we you know, see it coming out throughout the narrative in sort of moments of allegorical clarity, right? Not an allegorical structure that goes throughout, but clear moments where um, an expertise in Taoism is necessary to really understand the depths of what the author was doing with the story. Um, what's really interesting to me as I was reading through um, Yu's scholarship again was that he says basically, um, how do I want to put this, that there are many details throughout the novel that are directly traceable to sources in the Dao, um, in the Dao Zhang. Um, the Dao's like, canon. Yeah. Yes, the Dao's canon. And so like snippets of poetry that have been changed a little bit, um, elements where you can actually trace through um, a ritual guide to internal alchemy or to um, ritual itself. And Weirdly enough, so th these are like directly traceable quotes to all sorts of texts in the Taoist canon. For a text that on the surface level is about Buddhism, we don't have a lot of quotes from Buddhist sutras. We don't have a text that like shows us that the author was an expert on canonical Buddhism. In fact, most of the Buddhism that's within the novel is in many ways kind of popular understandings of Buddhism, um, popular Buddhist motifs. Uh, of course, we have the Heart Sutra because everybody knew the Heart Sutra. Um, so we're not seeing that kind of level of like scholarly engagement with the Buddhist canon in the novel, the way that the novel has an incredible scholarly engagement with the Taoist canon. Now, whatever this person was doing who put the novel together remains a mystery to all of us, perhaps even them. But it does show us that that 100-chapter novel is just shot through with Taoist imagery um, in a way that the Buddhist imagery is not mirroring it. I, 
I think I think it was an essay by Paul Katz. You know, it could have been somebody else, but I I uh-huh. I maybe I can find it and put it in the links, I hope. Uh-huh. Um but it was, you know, it was basically saying, you know, comparing Shioji and Function Yani, the, the canonization yeah. of the gods, yeah. and saying, I th- I think, if I get this right, that Shioji was written by a Taoist to criticize Buddhism. Uh-huh. Um and and uh, and and Feng Shan Yani was written by a Buddhist to criticize Taoism, and they ended up creating these I, these wonderful texts on Buddhism and Taoism, accidentally. It sounds like I I haven't read that before, but that makes a lot of sense. Also, sounds kind of like something that Paul Katz might say. If it wasn't him, it was someone. Yeah, someone but I, I like that. I like that yeah. point. It's it's. Um, I hope you find the link because I'd like to see that one too. Um, all right, I'm trying to remember what I have else here. Ah, so, hey, this is exactly what we were just talking about. Um, how do we end up reading the novel? You know, do we do it from a Buddhist standpoint as um, there are scholars out there who read it as Buddhist allegory? Do we read it as Taoist allegory in any sense, you know, from the Qing dynasty interpretation that it's like actually a secret manual for internal alchemical cultivation? You're yeah, really people? secret. Really secret. So secret, it's so hard to figure out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, that we had to write a novel to hide all of the secrecy. Um, yeah, yeah. Is it a Confucian interpretation that you, it's all about sort of like that kind of neo-Confucian self-cultivation? Is it three at once, right? Is it the San Jiao He, the three schools are together? Which the novel kind of continuously comes back to this idea of the three schools all are united in their sort of roots of their religion. Or is it, as um, Hu Shi said in the early 20th century, that we shouldn't be looking at it as religion at all. It's just a novel of profound nonsense, and we should appreciate that it's just all nonsense and, you know, a story about a monkey. Um, I think I disagree with the last one, but I think boy, do that, I! T- I disagree too. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> that I was their attempt at modern at, at joining modernity and 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 getting rid of some things and and bringing some things forward. Yeah, and boy, did they get it! I mean, you can't read. And Anthony, you said this. Um, he said this a number of times when I've heard him talk about the the novel. Is that like? it would be like trying to understand something from the Western literary canon without realizing the influence that like um, all of Christian tradition had on, you know, Shakespeare, for example, Mm. right? Like how can you read Shakespeare without thinking about um, the language of the King James Bible, the imagery from Catholic saints and from other aspects of Western European traditions, how can you read COG without putting it fully into the world of Chinese religions? Oh, it doesn't would, make any sense. I would take an even stronger position. Um, uh-huh. I would say it actually meets the most, re- the most reasonable definitions of religion, um, like not just Christianity as the only measure, but right, if you right. take a world definition of religion, it is religion. It's not mm-hmm. a novel it, in, in that sense. But the, pro- the reason we often can't see it is because we have this assumption that religion should be, be serious. Oh, this yeah, is yeah. Not serious. This is comic religion. So uh, I think this transitions really well into I just want to talk about my absolute favorite moment in the entire story. Um, oh, wait, actually, no, this is related to martial arts. So I okay, read okay. <laughs> among, among reading other things first, yeah. um, I was reading about some of the other moments in the story. And one of the really interesting points that came up that I wanted to just kind of put out there is that in chapter 88, um, the three disciples end up taking disciples of their own. Um, And and one of the points along the way in the story, and it being chapter 88, of course, is also numerologically significant. Um, But when they take disciples of their own, they don't just kind of impart... Um, spoken wisdom to them. They don't just teach them about um, internal alchemical cultivation or whatever it was that they did along their way to become immortals. They actually also specifically teach them martial arts with their specific weapons. 
And what that does is that shows us this integral part of martial arts and the link between each character and their specific weapon that they've been given, the staff, the rake, and um oh what's it called for the spatula or that? <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's a little um, pri- priestly staff <laughs> yeah but it's got a little it's got yeah, a little it's flame got that device little, on like, the end this little thing right? scooping yeah um yeah sometimes like that sometimes a little bit um more like a spade yeah i i i'm not trusting that the woodblock print got it all right <laughs> Um, but that like, that's really interesting, right? That, that, that they're showing that the cultivation, when they get their disciples, they're saying that it's not just about, um, cultivating the Tao sort of silently. It's also about taking part in that martial arts practice, right? It requires vigilant practice, um, with this kind of these divine weapons that they have as well. Um, I think that's quite fascinating too, um, because it shows again, this kind of integration of like um, bodily practice with the internal practice as well. Um, I think, so one of the things I kind of wanted to bring up is that, is this sort of idea that um, it's, there there's always this sort of um in in the theatrical realm right there is this story you know you could actually have the book backstage but then a lot of it in the theatrical realm was improvised Mm -hmm. uh and um and you know and oftentimes the actors were illiterate so they were learning they were stacking up a bunch of coins and then for each line, you get a coin, you get, you get moved, it, moved it over. That was the method of teaching until all the coins are on your side. And you have mm-hmm. to give them back and do it again or whatever. But it's like that was a way they would memorize these routines. But they also had these huge improvisational parts. And that they were then after midnight, the sort of idea after midnight, you, were, you would then improvise the same stories, but with lots of sexually explicit material and jokes. Mm-hmm. And that they, that so there's always this crazy, um, this it's this, it's like these narratives. If you look at it through that mind, is always threatening to spin off into some kind of um, bizarre sex escapade thing, or, or like lots of sex jokes, or like just mm-hmm. sort of hidden there. If you just change the way something's pronounced, it just blossoms into hysterical laughter. Which, by the way. The laughing action um, was thought to swallow Jing. Jing being not not uh, well, it could be semen, it could be right. um, the physical body, but it actually it being reproducing itself. But actually, meaning demons. Like so, it was you make them laugh in order you make the audience laugh in order to complete the exorcism because mm-hmm. the audience eats the demons. So there's this whole thing around the you know sex jokes and and the other on the unseen world of ghosts and demons and that these weapons Mm -hmm. um, are all sticks and that these, the, the, the pornographic version of the story is, um, was for a class of people called bear sticks. Ah, yeah, of course. The, the single men who could never get a wife because there were way too many women or way too many men anyway. Right. Right. And the bear sticks is um, describing the male genitals Mm -hmm. always being bare and, and also also their legs. It's also describing the family tree being a bare branch that can never fork. Ooh, that too. Mm -hmm. And so the, but the, the, if you notice the weapons here are not blades, Mm. All the weapons are sticks mm-hmm. in this story. Even the rake has, it's not really a blade. It's a stick with a thing on the end. Right. And um, the, the rake is just meant to be kind of a scatological joke too, right? Because it's a muckrake and he, the pig is in the shit and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, but the monkey's a weapon particularly is, you know, it's, it's initially, I guess it was initially the, the weapon it wasn't a weapon. It was a tool for measuring the for the the da yu, the great yu measured mm-hmm. how deep the rivers were, and then took the stick and like put it under the ocean in the 
palace as a pillar in the palace of the dragon king and the monkey gets in a fight and down there and ends up stealing the pillar and then it becomes his um he calls it needle and he keeps it behind his ear so it's really Mm -hmm. small until he's excited and then it gets big right right it represents again male genital organs and so there's this this thing about the way in which um uh Jing, the reprodu- the entire metaphor of the, of the golden elixir is like consolidating Jing, is making the physical body much more robust mm-hmm. with a, and they're like always carrying their erections with them in a kind of, like there's no, where are the women, or when they come in contact with women and it's like, here we are, you know, uh, with their sticks, you know, and there's a there's a whole thing like when I visualize it as theater, I'm like, oh, they're playing off of that metaphor all the time as well. So, little rant. <laughs> well, I'm yeah. I think there are parts of the the even just the novel version where you can see that kind of sticking through a little bit, um, it, it, especially because, like you said, the kind of the the novelistic version is the one that we don't actually get to see where the anarchy fully breaks out, but we see the potential for where the anarchy will break out after midnight. Right. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, right? You think about your, your, okay. So this just leads, I don't know if you were going to get to this, but let me ask it as a question. uh So um, the language how much education did you need to be able to read this? How much education did you need to be able to understand it read aloud? Um, Yeah. I think if you were, there are a couple ways that I've been thinking about this. Um, Mm -hmm. First of all, why would you, if you were somebody who was not incredibly well educated or even, you know, or, well educated enough to kind of have a knowledge of the Taoist canon, right? Why would you go to a hundred chapter novel if there were many other different venues in which you could encounter this same story? Um, so that's one sense. So if you're fully, if you are illiterate, you can get your kind of monkey fix from some other place than having to go to this novel. Mm. Um, but that being said, could somebody read aloud from the prose passages of the novel to you and you would enjoy it? Absolutely. Um, both, um, w- we know this also just from Anthony Yu's backstory. Um, you right. read the introduction to Monkey and the Monk, but he says that you know when he was a child refugee fleeing with his family during World War II in China, his grandfather would tell him these stories, but then also use the novel to teach him to kind of read as as a young boy. And so when Anthony, when when, when Anthony Yu read this novel the first time, it was all just like, "What's the fun of it?" And then what happens is that when he started to translate it, thinking, I'm just going to translate this fun novel I read as a kid, he started to realize just how utterly difficult it was. Because once you start actually reading it closely, it becomes really, really hard to grasp all the stuff that you kind of just gloss over. Like, oh, I don't get this Taoist reference, but whatever. I just want to see what the monkey's going to hit next. Yeah. Um, (laughs) You know? So I think that, you could read it as a as an educated but not you know um, highly educated person to read the poetry and the novel is just suffused with poetry. You would need a, a pretty good education to read the poetry, though. Uh, but to follow along with the prose, um, you could do that with uh, you know a few years of what we'd cons- what at that point would be considered primary level education. Um, that being said, it's not like literacy rates were all that high in the Ming and Qing anyway. So the primary way that anybody in China would have encountered this story would be through uh, oral medium. So, so could you talk a little bit about, about the oral medium? Like, you know, illiterate villager, what are they hearing? 
I yeah. work with texts. Right? <laughs> no, no, this is this is this like I, I'm not trying to like weasel out of the question, right? But this is the constant frustration that is mm. is my life, um, mm. because what really do we know about the majority of people who lived in this time period if what we have is only what's written? Um, Right. What, like, what does this give us? And yeah, go ahead. Well, well, I was, I was going to just push back on that a little bit. Yes. That's the problem, but mm -hmm. know the problem. And, and what do um, you do about it? Well, no, no, let, let yeah. me say this. Like, mm -hmm. uh, well, I could go off on various rants here, but let me just say that, that, um, if we don't, if we drop some of the, um, I don't want to call it pretense. It's not. I mean, there's a reason for it. But if we, if we drop some of our rigor, let's call it, say that. Let's, we drop some of our rigor um, and just go, well, what's more likely? Mm -hmm. What would you say? All right. Um, I think it's really interesting also that we kind of do still get hung up on the idea of like rigor is text only. Um, <laughs> right. There's, there's this, um, yeah. there's a book that I read last year. I think it just recently came out um, by Liu Yuhang called Becoming Guan Yin. And she writes about women's practices of Buddhist um, devotion. And she says, we have to kind of, divorce ourselves from this strict dependence on text if we want to learn anything about anybody who wasn't literate or wasn't you know writing representing themselves in their own writing so she analyzes things like women's embroidery um instead to say like what can this give us as a sense into their lives so i love that she's challenging that sense that like we can only be rigorous if we can read someone's first-hand account of something um, Right. So what else do we have? Um, we do know that there were, oops, sorry, cat bumped that. We do know that there were traveling storytellers and that there were oral storytelling venues, that this would be, um, you know, something that if you were, you know, in the marketplace, somebody might be telling a story. Um, probably kind of prosometric, right? Going from spoken full sentences to then poetry. Um, sung or chanted. Um, we also can assume that people would be seeing these at temple dramas. I mean, you go to go to Taiwan these days and you still see the same sort of thing, right? Where um, on certain days, the temple will have a stage set up, you know, directly across from where the gods are looking out. And the play is ostensibly for the gods to watch, but everybody local brings their stools and sits in front of the stage and watches the play happen as well. Um, I, you know, that would be a place where people would see these stories performed too. Oh, so they're, they are still, and they always were yes. for educating the gods mm -hmm. or entertaining them. I think it's entertaining. Um, yeah. Right, unless it's didactic play, right? <laughs> well, yeah. Well, that's that's the problem is that you get that kind of concern from, you know, the moralists that be saying, what do you mean the gods like these raunchy plays? Gods would never like such things. Mm. Um, and then trying to say, well, you know, we should have nice boring plays because the gods only like nice boring things. But we know that's not true. <laughs> um. <laughs> we know that's not true. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, so I, I, I was just going to add a little bit to that. That was great. Um, uh, well, actually, you sent me some stuff on... Um, uh, uh, water margin, the, the, um, the, mm -hmm. the other name for that. Um, all men are Out brothers or something yeah, like or that? outlaws of the marsh yeah outlaws of the marsh yeah um so that you know that there were the this there the actually storytellers material was like constructed um around like there was the, they had there there were like books for um
that were just like little sort of titles and oh, stuff. Oh, like prompt like books. Prom- prompt books. That's what they're mm-hmm. called. Yeah, yeah, prompt books. Yeah. Um, that, you know, w- where in the entire this massive story was actually mm-hmm. mostly improvised, but mm-hmm. it had all the little bits yeah. in there. Um, uh, in, I mean, in many ways, the water margin shows us what we can kind of imagine a proto journey to the West novel would be because water margin is much more like piece by piece, like, Oh, this storyteller's episode. And then he met this guy and then that guy went off and had an adventure. And then he met this guy and this guy went off and had an adventure um, in ways that, you know, the journey to the West with its 81 set, number of adventures kind of borrows from but really structures much better so the last episode i wanted to talk about is really my favorite um in part because it always comes up in conversation with anybody who's ever read the novel um and like brings it back to talk about with each other um perhaps especially maybe among academics who we would really like to believe in the futility of all writing but at the same time writing is so important for us and so are the written words Uh, In chapter 98 of the full novel, when they get to the Buddha, they meet the Buddha, and he says, yes, I will give you scriptures, go off and my assistants will give you some. And the assistants, acting like kind of true bureaucrats, say, well, where's our bribe, basically? Where's our gift? And the scripture pilgrims don't give them any gift at all. And so what happens as the pilgrims are leaving is they open up one of the scriptures and find out that they're just completely blank. And it's, it's hilarious because they then they're like, wait, they gave us all blank books. And so they go back to the Buddha and they complain that we got these crummy blank scriptures and we don't like, what are the use of these? The, um, Tripitaka even says, I'm going to be executed by the emperor if I show up with all of this, you know, nonsense, because he thinks that I, you know, went on this journey for nothing. And they're all really, really upset, and they get back, and the Buddha says to them, since you people came with empty hands to acquire scriptures, which is funny, he's saying that, like, the bribe is real, like, (laughs) we're given over to you. This is hilarious, right? Even the Buddha is like, you should have bribed my assistants. What's wrong with you people? Um, But these blank scriptures are actually true wordless scriptures, and they're just as good as those with words. However, those creatures in your land of the East are so foolish and unenlightened that I have no choice but to impart to you now the text with words. And what I love about this coming at the end of the whole book is that in a way I like it becoming a metaphor for the book itself. That like, if you were able to read Journey to the West without having to read any of the words at all, maybe you would actually get the truth. But since you are unenlightened and foolish, here is this fun novel. And I hope that somehow through it, you see some kind of enlightenment coming through. And I just think this, this idea is just so delightful to me because um, at the end of the whole thing, there's this moment where it seems like everything is futile. We went all this way, we got these blank scriptures and they're supposed to be enlightened by the end of the whole journey. And if they were really enlightened, wouldn't they know that the blank scriptures were better? But they're not. So they still have to be given scriptures with words and still have to go back to the land of the East, the foolish and unenlightened and try once again to just give some measure of truth to them in the facade of text that we all have to use because we can't talk wordlessly. Yeah, it, 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 it can be read as a, a critique of so many things. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to uh, stop share now because that was my last slide. Yeah. Cool. Um, the yeah. So in in the martial arts world, I'll just say that you know, I, and I think this is really true that uh, people people with a lot of experience with violence have access to a kind of emptiness that 
they can use to fight. And of course, if you, you never want to fight force against force because that's dumb. You mm-hmm. always want to fight mm-hmm. into emptiness. The problem is people can't see the emptiness or they can't mm-hmm. find it or can't feel it or don't trust it because you can't feel it. You can't mm-hmm. see it. So there's, you know, that it's, of course, it's always, and this is true throughout, I think that that not just this story, but many stories in Chinese culture, being completely empty is the highest level, mm-hmm. you know, or or doing the empty version. And the word empty, there are more than one word, right? But mm-hmm. uh, shu. Um, or kong. Yeah. Shu or kong. Right. So kong, so, so wukong, the name, in fact. Some to, to become aware to emptiness, right? Or enlightened to emptiness. But there's, mo- but there's more, right? If you're not reading just as characters, if you're hearing it as a pun. Yes. Yeah. There's like, it's, you know, unempty or something or, or mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know if you want to dive into that at all. Uh, different ways. His name is a pun. I wouldn't know where to begin. <laughs> It's, but I think, it, it's, it's yeah. like so I, we could go down quite a rabbit hole with thinking about what it means to be not empty, but to also be empty, but to, yeah. It's a setup anyway for like, mm-hmm. you know, in, in, for an improvisation. Like that, right? <laughs> I mean, the whole novel is in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what was I going to say about uh, emptiness? Um, uh, the <laughs> so meditation right itself is right this practice of resolving to emptiness um perhaps but um mm-hmm. I, there's also a critique here right so in of buddhism this relationship i i think this is really interesting and maybe this is my own take but that buddhism and Taoism sort of in certainly in our contempt well let me put this buddhism is um has a huge advantage like Christianity in the world um, because they come up up front. They're saying, Hey, we're going to alleviate suffering. So you should be a Buddhist, <laughs> right? It's like this, this great thing. And then you, and then you practice maybe some Chan Buddhism and it's like kind of indistinguishable from being depressed. You're like, Hmm, you know, and, and you meet these people, you meet these Buddhists that are like, Hi, my name is Scott. It's re- would you like some vegetarian food? And, you know, they're just deficient, right? Because the term shu, empty, also means deficient, in medicine anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so there's this, like, wh- um, the Taoist take on that, right, is like about, like, zhong, it's like to forget right? Rather than, they don't put the emptiness up front in the basic meditation training. It's actually, it's, it's sitting and forgetting. And that it seems to me, so this is me, my very disorganized way of saying something about the golden elixir, which is that it seems to me that the kind of straight version of Chuan Zhen teachings of the golden elixir are are really difficult to access. And it gets even worse when that stuff comes into the 20th century and they tried to describe the, the, you know, the, the circulation of chi by where it is in the body and stuff. And mm-hmm. they have this picture of that really, that really fat guy with like, you know, his lungs over here and there's like, a, mm-hmm. there's like an ox climbing up the spine and stuff. Well, that's <laughs> that like, wonderful chapter in COG, right? Where the cart slow kingdom, where they actually illustrate it. But they don't illustrate it. They, no, they, they act it out and they right, visualize right. it, right? Yes. So they're visualizing the two, the two ridges on the spine, mm-hmm. but not on the spine, on the sides of the back, right? Have to be really, really big so that the, circulation could pass through or something there's mm-hmm. a there's that that kind of stuff seems to me way more accessible that's kind mm-hmm. of what i wanted to say is that and 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 because it's putting it all forward as a joke mm-hmm. it doesn't 
you, you don't risk that, you know, I'm doing meditation and now I'm in some dark place trying to overcome suffering, you know. Anyway, that wasn't very well organized thought, but I think you get it. I think I get it, yeah. Uh, let's see if I had any more questions for you specifically. Um, that was great. That covered all the things I thought. I, I think we covered everything I wanted to cover. I, I personally have a couple thing, more things to say, and then I should dig into some of your scholarship if we don't run out of time. Um, mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I just wanted to say, okay, so this is this thing about about the the golden elixir is throughout this story. Mm -hmm. And in English, we keep getting translations. The first one, I think, was one that Jung had in German, translation of the golden flower. So it's been in English for 100, 150 years or something, quite a while. Um or sorry, it's been in Western languages, and then and mm -hmm. William, the guy, same guy who translated the the I Ching, uh, I have that original one over here somewhere. Oh well, um, and and then uh, Michael Sasso in like the late seventies translates um, the the Secret of the Golden Flower, um, and then and tries to like describes these visualizations, but then also describes the body parts, and then you get, and then. And then we start to get like serious scholarship about, you know, translations of, uh, you know, Liu Yiming, people who are, are, you know, were experts in the golden elixir in the Qing dynasty and, and also early history of the golden elixir and, and, you know, Gu Hong and all, all this stuff is getting translated. And, um, and it's incredibly inaccessible, I think. I, I think that that um, there's an inc there's, a, there's a terrible irony that the scholars are doing this wonderful job of doing translation, you know, of translating this material for people who might be interested in doing it or or have been introduced to it in some way, mm -hmm. um, and they've made a commitment to not do it you know, to not learn it themselves. So they've actually made it kind of impossible for themselves to understand it if it's a thing you do. And there's this terrible paradox that I think we're facing. And, and I don't know, it's my hope, actually. It's, it's my current thinking that it's through stories like Journey to the West that people can actually gain access to this stuff because it, it gets repeated so many times and in such visually dynamic ways. And it's all about lightening up. You know, if you get it, you don't get, it doesn't matter so much. Mm -hmm. um, and if I'm really ranting, because I came up with this this morning, because it's, it's kind of funny and almost, uh, it seems like the entire scholarly community has decided, and this came up because I, I, I wrote an article for the Journal of Taoist Studies, and I had one of the fights I had with my editor, and my editor was wonderful. I mean, it, it's, this is not a critique, really, of her. It's just that I, I, I was losing the battle about whether or not to translate the term Jing, um, that there's this convention, that it, and there's this problem with Qi, too, that what, wanting to translate Qi. Um, but you know, why the, the Jing has to be translated as essence. And I was like, well, if I'm going to do that, she's like, you must do this. And I'm like, well, if I'm going to do that, you have to let me put my definition of Jing in there. And then, um, and then when you switch to essence, you realize that now people are going to have to real th think in their head, oh, essence means Jing and Jing means his definition. Like, it makes it really hard. Like, I think it made my work less understandable. It was very frustrating. Uh, although I, I fought every imagine that I could. I fought for it. But this is the thing, right? Like, the term Jing, um, what, is this thing that arises spontaneously when 
like you wake up in the morning or something and it comes out of the kidneys and uh and remakes your body and so it is your body but i mean yeah you could call that essence but that that's really a very specific context and then it also means sperm or you could say spermatic essence as as uh, as anthony you did i'm like oh man that's getting weird um and what do you think about this? I, oh, I guess I was going to follow it up by saying translation. Yeah, yeah. Like, what are we doing when we translate? Like that itself is a question that has no single answer. Well, Narbakov had made four rules, didn't he? Do you know the, the four rules? I for, I forget them, but I think this breaks all four of them. <laughs> I think. Um, uh, it's anyway. It. Yeah. I guess I I guess that's really just um for me to get you to talk a little bit about translation. Oh man. I mean, I talk about translation all the time with my MA students because like this is not something like, like it doesn't have one answer. Um ultimately it's about your audience. It has to be, right? Like what is who are you trying to translate for? Um are you trying to translate for a um, a mass audience to enjoy. And like the journey to the West is a great example because, um, you know, the Anthony Yu versions, when he translated the full hundred chapter version, it was because he said that, you know, as much as uh, Whaley's translation monkey did in a way a great service to the book by getting it in sort of the minds of people who were English readers, it also did an incredible disservice to kind of the the complex nature of the book because it took it from being a you know a, a unitary whole, particularly a unitary whole between the poetry sections and the prose sections, and just sort of made it into a different sort of text. And so you wanted to translate the entire novel with everything including all of the poetry to say look we if we're going to read this book we should do it with uh, respect to the entire piece that being said though once he translated that whole book it became clear that that wasn't going to attract people to read his massive four volume incredibly well footnoted work and so that's why he ended up coming out with the condensed version because the condensed version tries to kind of do the best of both worlds where it both has all the footnotes, but also is, is short enough that you could pick it up and read it and enjoy it yourself. Um, and so we can kind of see that you made this compromise in one way, but he didn't compromise on kind of the language and the scholarly apparatus of all of these, um, you know, notes, although there are not as many notes in this as I would expect, right? There's quite few. Um, mm -hmm. So that's one sense, like, who's your audience? Are you trying to yeah. talk to a bunch of other scholars who have scholarly conventions, in which case you are talking to a group of about this many people? And, you know, I talk to those people a lot. They're like my friends. But yeah. I know that when I'm talking to that group, I'm going to be using different vocabulary and really carefully pick my words because there are sort of agreed upon norms or agreed upon kind of um, complexities, right? So if I'm talking to people who work on late imperial Chinese literature, I probably wouldn't even use the word novel, honestly, um, because that doesn't really describe a zhang jie xiao shuo, but or a, a, a a xiao shuo, um, a piece of fiction that's divided into chapters. Um, what happens when you're, you know, this, this is, I think, where this issue of jing as essence becomes a bit strange is because I would just want to leave it as the word jing, right? And just kind of move on with that rather than choosing one English word. Because that's where we get into trouble is when we try to pin down this massive abstract Chinese term into one 
abstract but not in the same way English word. So Jing and Qi, even Xiao Shuo that I just had trouble translating now because we don't translate it as novel because novel is too limiting. Then what do we call it, right? Or when we talk about Jiao, right? The three schools, the three religions. Families. Families. Homes. Yeah. <laughs> teachings right. see right. like we get into all kinds of trouble that way and the best that we can do is just kind of explain to our audiences the choices that we make um mm -hmm. so i tend to like informative footnotes <laughs> yeah well we both love footnotes that's you know um mm -hmm. i i think that yeah yeah it makes you know it 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 often argues for like writing the same passage three times. Sometimes I think some sometimes, especially when we talk about these things with with dense metaphors. And I don't know. I mean, I'm not I'm not a translator. I, I yeah. I'm just sort of saying that you know. Or you know, it, interesting as a as a translator, like how do you get the how do you get the reader to slow down and go? Well, what? How else could this? What else could this mean? What else could this mean? You know, just when you just said writing the passage three times, have you ever read, um, it's Marjorie Wolf's book, The Thrice Told Tale? Um, no, but it sounds like something else I've read. <laughs> uh, so what she does in this is that, so she was, you know, doing field work in Taiwan. And um, what she does in The Thrice Told Tale is she takes this story of a woman who was claiming to be possessed and kind of having medium-like experiences and going into trances. And she, what she shares is she shares her own kind of personalized narrative of being the field worker, sort of observing this. She then share, and it almost like in a fictionalized way where, um, you know, it, it, it's told narratively then she shares i think her field work notes and then she shares the academic article that she writes based off of that and she says you know in a way none of these tales really gets you back to the moment of those weeks in that village where we didn't know if this woman would become another medium for the village or would be you know just rejected as being crazy and the the ending is she's rejected as being crazy um, but maybe oh. if I tell you the story from three different ways, you'll be able to start to get back to that experience, um, which I think is utterly fascinating. And yeah, that's I, a think, way. I think that kind of approach is really valuable. I, I actually have been advocating various versions of that. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, too. Well, that's nice. Uh, um, I'll have to read that. Uh, you know, it just reminded me of that you you actually recommended I watch Teen Psychic. Yes. Which I haven't. I'm going to binge that this week if I can. But it's on Showtime, right? And it's a Taiwanese Showtime? It's on HBO. HBO. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I was able to buy the DVD of the first season, which is six episodes long. Um, and unfortunately, the DVD only has Chinese subtitles. But I've talked to other scholars because um, I was like, I would love to teach with this. Like, it's just so much fun. It's both, you know, pop culture, but it's also, you know, quite respectful of being immersed in Taiwanese religious society as well. Um, but uh, if you subscribe to HBO online or whatever their service is called, you can get the English subtitles. Um, they did come out with a second season. I have not yet seen the second season. Um, I think the first season is, you know, it's both a ridiculous teen drama about a kid who wants to be a normal teenager, but she also has to go to the temple every night and be a medium. Because she's it's been chosen. She has, yeah. For fate. Yeah. Cool. I, oh, um, pop culture. Uh -huh. of, do you have a favorite version of the, the film or TV version of Journey to the West? I really haven't watched much, so I don't. Okay. Um, yeah. 
I don't that's either, easy. but you know, I mean, there's a bunch, there's a lot of boys. There are a lot out there. Yes. Um, I think, I think, uh, people are seeing them. Uh, let me ask you about your, about your, your current scholarship. You, you've, you've done a lot of interesting work. Um, you, you, well, go ahead. You talk about it. I'm not going to introduce you. You, you do it. What, what are you working on? All right. Um, so in general, I have been using Chinese, or I've been engaging with Chinese religious narratives to try to kind of put them back into a larger context of Chinese history and liter literary culture more broadly. Um, so one way of describing the book that I'm working on is using um, texts that were intended to become popular religious texts to then understand more broadly what was really going on in the late 19th century with regard to um, sort of society starting to fall apart as a result of both the Opium Wars and also the Taiping Civil War, but also what um, sort of mid-level um, charismatic Confucians were trying to do to rebuild society by kind of grasping at every possible way they could to bring morality back into society. And so where this takes me is um, looking in specifically at some precious scrolls, which is a genre called Baojuan, that were written by these Confucians in the hopes that they could reach out to popular audiences. Like maybe if we can use the genres that they like, they'll, um, you know, not only will they become more moral, but ultimately by kind of spreading this morality throughout society, the heavenly response will be um, peace instead of the constant drumbeat of war and disaster that we can describe the 19th century as in China. Um, the roots of this genre go back into the Ming, actually, um, into kind of that same era that we were just talking about with the journey to the West. Um, if you want, I can kind of go through a really brief presentation of what this precious scroll genre is. Because um, I really think that, you know, as much as people have read Precious Scrolls as like, okay, this is, you know, some religious text that's over here, this is some popular practice, that what happens when we look at religious texts, not just Precious Scrolls, but also morality books, um, those um, ledgers of merit and demerit, um, Taoist um, talismans or ritual manuals, all of these different texts. It's when we, we can't just look at them and say, okay, we're looking at religion as this like separate box over here, right? Um, we need to use these texts to figure out or to use them as lenses into um, economic history, social history, intellectual history, um, literary history, and um, our understandings of culture more broadly than just kind of oops, sorry our understandings of culture more broadly than just like what was happening at kind of the upper echelons of politics and society um, and maybe if we look at religious texts seriously then we can have a better sense of history overall um so i would like to share just a little bit yeah about go the i have so many questions but go go well, I don't know if we're going to get to all the questions. We'll try. Um, all right. Okay. So I work on a lot of different things um, in the book project that I'm working on now. I have a few Baojun and Precious Scrolls that I'm focusing on, but I'm also looking at morality plays, elementary school textbooks, poetry collections, all sorts of stuff like that. But let's just talk about this genre in particular, because that's how I got started down this long road. Um, ultimately, I've always been interested in um, narrative and um, expressions of religious practice and belief. And when I realized that there is this genre called Baojun, Precious Scrolls, Precious Volumes, translate it how you will, um, this helped me to kind of narrow in more on things that I was interested in. So what are Baojun overall? When we're talking about Baojun, we're looking at, ooh, I'm sorry about that. 
Let's just look at Scott. Okay. Um, Baldrin are prosymmetric again. So we're looking at a mix of um, prose narration and then sung or chanted sections of poetry, sometimes rhyming, sometimes not. Um, these change over time. The earliest Belgian that we have um, are from rather early, from like, uh, I want to say the 13th century, we have examples of texts that we can see as being beginning of the genre. Ultimately, when we're looking at these texts, we're talking about written texts, but they are written texts that allow for performance. Um, either they're meant to be performed by a cleric or even a lay person. They link, particularly in the Ming Dynasty, when we first begin to see uh, kind of the first fluorescence of the genre, uh, links to Buddhist preaching, kind of popularized stories of uh, the Bodhisattva Guan Yin in one of her incarnations. Um, there's a lot of early examples of stories relating to Mulian, the, uh, the filial monk who goes down to hell and saves his mother from hell. But um, they very quickly also become a vehicle for new religious expression. Um, and in the late Ming, that means relating to the eternal mother cult. Um, and the eternal mother was seen, or the unborn mother, as she sometimes also called. Wang, Wang Mu Sheng. Uh, Wu Sheng Lao Mu. Wu Sheng Lao. So the unborn old mother, quite literally, um, was seen as being uh, like a consort to the old Buddha who had given the Gu Fu, who had given birth to a certain number of children, sent them into the world, and now that the world was on the verge of collapse, late Ming, um, now that the world was on the verge of collapse, we, um, the eternal mother is now drawing all of her children back into her bosom so long as they, you know, believe in what she says. Um, this led to kind of a, a sense that Bao Jun overall were often quite heterodox, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, Bao Jun itself is just this prosymmetric genre alternating between songs and poetry and prose that um, quite honestly do create a ritual space by saying, you know, the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are now down here with us. They're going to listen as we listen to this story. And then at the end of the ritual, we will send them back and we will have achieved a certain kind of merit. And so um, by the time that we're looking at late Ming and into the Qing, it's not just Buddhist, it's not just heterodox, it also includes a significant amount of Taoist belief. You can have, there's a, uh, a Baldrin dedicated to the three Mao lords of Mao Shan, um, and also popular Confucianism. Um, so stories about Confucian luminaries as well. Uh, let me just show you what these look like. Oh, go ahead. So, so we're talking, there are thousands of them, right? Yes. To study. Um, uh, and, and there's also, they, they in some sense belong to this other category of religion that, that, nobody, that, that has been called popular religion or something that no one quite knows what to call it because it keeps mixing. And there is a, and, right. And, and martial, I, it's my suspicion, strong suspicion that martial arts often interacted with these Baudrin in, in the sense that, that that invocation for teaching was also used to teach martial arts, whether or not there was a Baudrin involved, that mm -hmm. you, you, when you practice, you're bringing down the Bodhisattva too. Mm -hmm. Well, and then, I mean, with th this is all part of a larger complex of... Uh, performed ritual and lay ritual, right? That you um, are able to practice um, as part of, as part of fulfilling many different needs. Um, with Bao Jun, you're fulfilling in, in one sense, the same way that with Journey to the West, you're getting an entertaining tale out of it at the same time as also having an edifying experience, at the same time as also performing a necessary ritual that the audience participates in. Mm -hmm. um, so when we look at early Bao Jun, they really do, um, oh, you don't need to see that, I don't think. Um, when we look at early Bao Jun, they really do look a lot like Buddhist sutras. Um, you know, they have these 
this is this wonderful opening image um, from what I believe is an early Qing Bao Jun, although it's not dated, perhaps it's late Ming. Um, it's got that accordion style fold. You have Buddha, you have a very cute Qilin. Um, Mulian is labeled here. Um, we also have, you know, a, various different other deities who are represented. Um, and you kind of see how we have the setting up, uh, a song of setting up the incense. We have a gata on the opening of the sutra, and then it begins the baljuan. So we really do see kind of the ritual opening. And we even see represented all of the various deities who are sort of showing up for the event. Um, this format shifted during the Qing. Um, in the Ming Dynasty, we actually ha have tune titles from popular opera that are in Baojuan as well, which I, I know that you like seeing that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you would sing this song to the little red shoes and you would sing this song to the tune, you know, going up the little pagoda or going up the stairs. And um, these tune titles fall out of um, Baojuan formatting by the time we get to the Qing and the stuff that I work on. But it's just this wonderfully evocative moment of real kind of like earthy performance in these, these Buddhist texts, right? This one is about the Medicine King. Um, mm -hmm. Once we get into the Qing though, um, Baljuns start to look very different. They start to look more just like your average book. They're not bound most of the time. You, you still get some of these sutra style ones. They start to look more like a regular book, um, like a string bound book that we're used to. Um, this is one that I've spent a lot of time working on. So I just was able to throw these slides in here. Uh, this is a story about a um, incredibly devout lay Buddhist woman named Liu Xiangnu. Um, and I just want to show you a few kind of images. So first of all, what you notice is that she borrows from a lot of like Guanyin style imagery too. Um, there is a version of Liu Xiang Baojuan that's retold down in um, Fuzhou where she's actually more of a Taoist saint and she rides a cloud. This is not that version. This is the much more lay Buddhist version where she's, you know, a vegetarian and she recommends Nian Fu and things like that, reciting the name of the Buddha. Mm -hmm. um, but you see here that we still have this invocation, you know, first set up your incense, then read the opening invocation. Um, so here's your incense prayer. Then you say Nam Mo, and you, you recite this three times. Then you give this opening. You know, now we've opened this Bao Juan, mm. and then we give another opening, and we have, um, now that the Liu Shang Bao Juan has first been opened, the various Buddhas and Bodhisattvas all come down and join us. Um, and what you see in something like this is this, when I say prosymmetric, this is really what I mean, is that we have seven line poetry then we have a prose section that explains something a little bit more and then we can switch into these 10 line poetry as well for this kind of metrical variation um, there are a few songs within this text but they don't have titles for their tunes so i guess you would expect that whoever was reading it either knew the tune or at least could just kind of come with the tune on the fly Interestingly, even though these are sort of really active during the Qing, even into the Republican era, we see that Baojun tradition persists. Um, in the Republican era, we see that it gets modified even further. They are spread in um, Shanghai with these lithographic presses. So just taking a look at the quality difference between the image here of our heroine of the Ocean Baljun and our image here of our heroine, we see that the um, the impact of the technology itself on the kinds of imagery that can be used, right? There's this beautiful lithographic print. Um, lithographic print also allowed for text to get a lot smaller, um, a lot less paper. What I want to point out here is that this is the close of the story. And at the close of the story, we still have 
this kind of invocation about, um, so they say something about blessing the um, emperor. So Huang Di Wen Wen Cun, Huang Di Wen Wen Cun. So the emperor will have tens upon tens of thousands of springs. And then we get, um, now our merit has been cultivated in this way and it will kind of spread out throughout the world. And then um, some other kind of closing instructions. So we really do have an opening ritual, a narrative, and the narrative itself has little rituals spread throughout it, and then a closing ritual. So that at the same time as you are enjoying this wonderful story about a woman who is kind of going on her own spiritual quest, and in the end she wins, um, she really wins. Um, then you have kind of also created that sense of merit. You have um, had a full religious experience. The last thing I want to show is just something that I find utterly delightful, still just in this realm of this one Liu Xiang Bao Juan, because this is a very popular story, is I found this one from Taiwan, and it printed in the 1950s. And what we had here at the closing invocation of the emperor, the emperor, the emperor, yeah. in this Taiwan one, we have the president, the president, and the Republic of China. <laughs> um, so, Zongtong Wan Wan Sun, Zongtong Wan Wan Sun. Um, and then we get the closing of, you know, here our merit has oh. been completed, it is without limit, it is spread out throughout the world. So. Yeah. And that's, I'm going to stop share and let's just talk some more. That was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, uh, you answered so many questions. Let's see. Oh, all right. So, so in the research you're doing right now, there, there's this sort of, I, there, there are these, these well-educated scholars who are maybe government officials or, 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 uh, or want to be government officials, right. They're marginalized maybe in some way, but they want to mm -hmm. fix the world. Um, mm -hmm. and so they're, they're taking something from the past, right? They're taking a, a mode that they now think has failed and they're, well, and they're, oh, putting, I into see. New, they're putting mm -hmm. it into something, a new mode, which they think mm -hmm. will work. And then, right. And then that's particularly important because they, they end up being a bridge to something now. Something now being? <laughs> well, our current understanding or, or, or current religion as it's practiced in mm -hmm. Taiwan or something. You know, like, I'm not exactly sure, but I just was... I, I, was, talk, I was thinking in terms of their particular importance, like that you can understand what these people were doing, but also that it, mm -hmm. it how did it, how does it come to us? Or it, in, it ended up influencing what we see the subject as. Hmm. Trying That's to figure terrible, out. Yeah, sorry. Trying to figure out what really, how to answer that. Because I, so I was, I was completely with you right at the beginning, right? The, the right. weird right. project that I'm working on is kind of like a sidebar to um, kind of mainstream 19th century um, publication and devotion and practice of Baldrian. Um, and that sort of mainstream Baldrian practice of looking at, you know, these popular Buddhist texts or these kind of popular diffuse religious texts um, is something that, although it kind of dies out in China during, you know, the post-49 through into the 80s, after that, we actually see a, a present-day revitalization of Baldrian performance in places like Shanghai and Suzhou. Um, I don't do field work, um, although there is a wonderful amount of field work out there by um, Chinese scholars and uh, a few scholars in the U.S. who do go to these um, these rituals and kind of observe what it's like to go to a Baldrian performance in 2020, right? Um, so the, the, what I'm interested in, the, the kind of current project I'm working on, is actually instead looking at this like sidebar, which is like you described. Um, 
people in a moment of crisis trying to say, well, our way of communicating what we believe sort of social order should be and moral order, which then, you know, cosmologically speaking, you know, continues to preserve order rather than sending down disorder. Our way of trying to teach people that has failed. And what can we do in a moment of crisis, but perhaps look for other options to get the message out? And that's where this, this kind of sidebar version of, of understanding Baldrian comes in, because I think it's fascinating that we have this effort to take a popular practice and say, well, let's try using that container instead. Right? Let's try to put um, our sort of messages of... Um, it's not just kind of Confucian morality. It actually has a lot of Taoism in it too. Um, there's a particular reverence for the five grains and written paper that is, is in many ways very mystically Taoist. Um, let's try to put that into a medium that people will appreciate so that they can then grasp onto it. Um, it's not just Baojun. When I, we were talking about theater earlier, um, the same guy who was writing a few of these Baojun and publishing them um, was also really uh, a strong advocate for morality theater. He really hated that um, people would perform what he called immoral plays at temple festivals. And he said that the, the, the performance of these immoral plays was one reason why like the Taiping War happened, right? Because mm -hmm. it's punishment. The gods actually really hate seeing those plays. And so what we have to do is we, um, that this guy was saying that one of the reasons why things like the Taiping War and other, you know, famines and disasters and natural disasters were happening was, you know, pervasive immorality, one of which is that um, the kinds of plays that are being performed for gods at temple festivals were immoral plays and the gods were angry. And people think that when they perform immoral plays for the gods, the gods enjoy them, but really the gods hate that and they want to watch good, you know, firm morality instead. And so he actually wrote uh, 28 morality plays that we have now that we can look at and see. Um, how he thought he could maybe entertain the gods with his um, rather boring jokes. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, are they boring? I mean, what, what, did he have a theory that if the gods are bored, isn't there a saying like when the, when the emperor is obsessed with his horses, the country is at peace or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I've heard that phrase. Yeah, I don't know. I think it was mostly like, I'm not entirely sure what he, you know, he didn't want to bore the gods. I think he thought that the gods themselves just only want to see, you know, good moral stuff on stage. Well, so, but there's this move, there's this kind of popularism that like that actually gets started, right? Yes. And, and right, yeah. right, because you have this concept in China, right? Of like um, the, the emperor, like if the emperor's conduct is perfect, country will run perfectly from Manchester. Right, really. and instead we're starting from the other way, right? This is in a way quite neo-Confucian, where we actually have to start with every single individual person and their conduct has to be perfect and we have to work our way back up. Because the guy on top screwed it or, or because... Or maybe because maybe it doesn't work that way anymore. Maybe oh. we tried the gut, maybe we tried getting the guy on top to be moral and like that didn't mean that the people on the bottom were moral, even if we had a super moral emperor. So what if we start instead by saying, let's try to do something we can control um, and start with like the individual self and the cultivation of the individual self. And maybe that can work outwards. But this is a quintessential issue in, in sort of Chinese civilization. Yes. Uh, that, that, right. That Lao Tzu is originally seen as this, you know, a, a book for princes and kings. And then it's like, well, wait, anybody could do this and anyone can remake the world, mm -hmm. you know, by th through, uh, through their perfect not doing, through perfectly not doing or something like that. And, and, yeah. and that, 
and then you know the Confucian version of it is is this de right that same Dao de the de is that mm -hmm. you know if 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 someone really has it you know this charismatic de all the neighboring countries will come to the border and lay down their arms right, right? that's very Menchian right yeah and want to join up right mm -hmm. and that and but then when you get Jushi in the Sung Dynasty is kind of reworking that. Are you saying that they're they're now trying to take Jushi and make it more popular? My guy is. <laughs> Your so, guy is. Like, yeah, yeah. They they being yeah. like a group. The the sort of again this like this this one reformer as a really interesting example of somebody who was like, hey guys, I think I've figured out what we can do in this moment of crisis. Um, and he had a lot of supporters um, who were, you know, fairly high up as as reformers who were actually in government. Um, so I'm still, you know, figuring out how exactly to communicate this project in a way that makes sense to people. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what it has meant is that I can get really stuck into some really wonderful, weird resources. Um, so I get to look at these these morality plays that you know are not funny. They, they try to be funny. There's clowns in them, right? Like they have, Yuzi did try to put in humor because the people like humor. I'm just not quite sure how good he was at humor. Um, you know, there's a, there's a scene where everybody, you know, laughs and taunts the decapitated corpse of a Taiping rebel. Ha ha. <laughs> yeah. Ha ha. Hilarious. He got <laughs> okay. eaten by dogs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I, you know, I'm looking at like his um, elementary school textbooks. He's got a series of um, illustrated morality tales that were meant to teach little boys classical Chinese, which are just delightful. You know, the thunder gods are striking people down left and right. Um, and like, I think that like there's so much like vitality and interest and just weird, fun stuff if we kind of get beyond just like the official narrative histories and these classical essays, right? Which Yudzi also wrote, kind of classical language essays trying to advise people on governance. But that wasn't his only medium. Instead, he was also working in all of these genres meant to kind of talk to people where they were. And I really want us to spend more time looking at stuff like that and trying to figure out like what else was going on. Well, you really care. I mean, yeah, if I, I wouldn't do this <laughs> if I didn't care, right? Like, well, I so I mean, I think I just came out, but um, which is me just stating the obvious. But what what I want to, you really care about literature, language, and Chinese culture. Why? Yeah. I mean, the first, my first inclination is like, well, why not? Well, um, fine. I, I do yeah. too, but I think yeah. we come, and I think we, w one of the reasons why we enjoy each other. Mm -hmm. But, um, but I just thought I, since you're, I put you on the spot before I say goodbye. Cause uh -huh. we're, we're no, I think this is, yeah. So we should, we should wrap this up, but I think. Why do you in care? Brief, yeah. Um, so when I started, uh, when I came to America for college at 18, right, I, I spoke Chinese. Um, I figured I wanted to do something with my Chinese and I didn't know what. Um, so I'd been born and raised in Taiwan. I'd gone to American schools, but I, you know, I'm bi trilingual. I don't, I don't know how many languages are in my head. Um, but through college, reading these novels and kind of getting into the sense that like, oh, I have in some ways uh, a way to read these, these texts that is both very much like part of me already. Like I would see resonances to like, oh, now I understand why there was this play in front of the temple outside my house when I was a kid. Right. So in some ways it was trying to understand the world that I had lived in. Mm -hmm. um, and then going to graduate school, that's really where it became clear is that like, as much as I've been reading literati novels and sort of high culture work, the truth is that like I had like lived an average life in Taiwan, right? Like you get to know your neighborhood aunties, you go to the market, you do the kid stuff, you take your stool out to the temple and watch the shows. Um, you hear the, the parades on the streets, you know, you 
You have an auntie who teaches you how to do this, even though you don't know what it means. Um, and I really thought like, I'm sick of studying so much stuff about the Ming and Qing that is just about that upper level of society, right? Like, isn't it, is it at all possible to get at least closer to some kind of lived experience of the past? Like, is there a way to know the, the neighborhood auntie of the late 19th century? No, there probably isn't really. But can I find hints of what she was listening to in other things that I read, right? Is there a way to make the past of Chinese literature, Chinese culture, intimate in the way that like, I intimately lived my present in Taiwan? So maybe that's a way of answering why I care so much. That's a good answer. What do you really, what do you really, this, what do you really like about it? What's, what's, uni what's unique about the culture that you study or are, are encouraging people to understand that you really like? It's so hard. There's so many things I like. Um, to pick one is very difficult. Um, you don't have also, to pick one. You can pick one generally. You can <laughs> or pick one. Um, how do I how do I do this? Especially in so little time. I really like um especially when I'm teaching Civ, um especially because I'm teaching it to kind of a lot of um students in the US who maybe have a very serious um, impression about Chinese civilization and culture, um, both kind of in the present, but especially in the past, right? Like everybody was really conservative and well-behaved in the past. Um, to bring to them a sense of just how much fun there is to be had in engaging with this this, like reading these stories from the past is never just about staying in the past, right? It's about kind of connecting with the present and seeing um, parallels or reuses of images and being able to kind of like identify that and say, hey, I know where that's from. I know what that means. Um, that kind of recognition, I think, is really important, right? To help to bring that sense of fun um, of literature of the past and of relevance to the present as well. Mm. I don't know if I answered your question well. No, thank you so much. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I know, I know exactly that was great because I know exactly what you mean that, that, you know, and, and one of the things I, I, I'm always trying to impart to my martial arts students, but uh, you know, if I sit down somebody asked me about it, so a poem you know, I'm like, yeah, just dive in, look, this whole, there's this quality of Chinese culture, which is like, there's a little bit of a surface. And then it's, if you start to get the associations, it's often these layers and layers. Well, it and layers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure. It always mm -hmm. is talking to you, Scott. <laughs> Thank you. And, and that was fantastic. People are going to love this. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank all of you for listening. If you like this interview and you'd like more, one way you can support me is through patreon.com. Uh, it's my account is Scott Park Phillips. And for $10, you often get uh, previews of these videos and other videos and articles that I link to. In the meantime, please buy my book. It's available at Amazon.com.